Hi, my name is Pastor Rick Thomas. I pastor Moxie Community Church in Wyalusing, Pennsylvania. This message was given yesterday. I am re-recording it until we can figure out how to broadcast it live and then put it on our blog site for those who are unable to come to church. I have started a Christmas series messages that will take place over the next several weeks. And we have a bulk mailing list to about 119 people when it comes down to the go to meeting opportunities that we present each week. <laughs> um, I put out a question to them, uh, asking them, uh, did Christmas begin when Jesus was born? And that is where we often associate Christmas beginning uh, in Bethlehem, at the stable, in the manger, surrounded with the shepherds, Joseph and Mary. My survey revealed the following. 53% said no. 46% said yes. And then about 1% was unsure of when Christmas began. So I decided to go ahead and show biblically when Christmas began. Now, we need to answer a couple of questions to set the stage. If Christmas did not begin with the birth of Jesus, then when did it begin? Um, what makes it so important to know when Christmas began? And that question will be answered at the end of this broadcast. But this is the direction that we want to go. So to know when Christmas began, you must know the reason for Christmas. And of course, how many times have we heard Jesus is the reason for the season? That's a nice rhythmic saying. However, I think it begs the question, understanding the why of Christmas will lead us to the beginning. And so that's my intent for the message I gave on Sunday and that I'm re-recording for you. So let's start from where we're at and work backwards. Oliver Cromwell was a Puritan who was in charge of the um, parliament military um, and came over to the New World with the colonies. And he saw the decadent celebration of the holidays over in England. And he was determined that this frivolity and uh, decadent behavior was not going to be a part of the new world. And so he issued a ban on Christmas that went from 1659 to 1681. And there was a five shilling fine in Boston that if you were caught celebrating the holidays, any type of festive behavior, you would have to pay five shillings. Now, in actuality, the official holiday for Christmas did not was not established until June 26th, 1870 by President Ulysses S. Grant. That's when it became a federal holiday. Prior to that time, Christmas was not a universal celebration of Christ's birth. Um, Christians adapted the Roman Saturnalia holiday that ran from December 17 to the 25th. It was a Roman pagan holiday, and the Christians tried to take those festivities and put a Christian spin on it. Uh, the celebration was 
contributed or was was attributed to uh, the ending of winter and the beginning of spring. And long winters, the solace time, was very depressing and very discouraging uh, to people. And so near the end of winter, uh, the sun stayed out a little bit longer. They would get these huge logs and they would set them on fire. You would know them today as the Yule log. And their belief was that every spark that ascended into the heavens was a newborn pig or calf that would be coming in the spring. It was also a time of, uh, as Cromwell uh, said in his writings, a time of carding. In other words, they were playing cards and drinking and festivity and sexual immorality. And Cromwell, Cromwell even thought that it was related to Catholicism that they had set up the celebration of Christmas. And so from his perspective, this was a pagan holiday. And in light of the Christian church not having anything specific about Christmas, he put two and two together. Now, in actuality, the first Christmas celebration was in 336 AD under the Roman Emperor Constantine. Now, Constantine had gotten saved and he converted the entire Roman Empire. And this is when historians say the first observation of Christmas was conducted in 336 AD. Prior to that, the only Christian holiday celebrated by the church was Easter. Easter, not the nativity, not Christmas. It was Easter. Now, some people try to validate that December 25th is when Jesus was born. And there is a legend that was circulated that the Annunciation to Mary, that she would bear the Christ child, was supposedly given on March 25th. However, I could not find how they uh, reached that calculation of March 25th, not April, not February, not January. But if you go by March 25th and you add nine months to it, well, guess what? You come up with December 25th. This is a legend. There is nothing in the Bible. There is nothing in Christian literature that says Jesus was born on December 25th. You also have to keep in mind at that time, and as history, church history developed, there were two different calendars as well um, that uh, the Christian people used, depending if they were in the East or in the West. So let's start from the nativity then and work backwards. In Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 and 10. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you scripture, and you will see on the screen of your computer words that are bold and underlined. I believe these words give us an indication of the true meaning of Christmas and will guide us back to when this was all set in motion. So in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 and 10, he will ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. Now, we know who that is, right? That's Jesus Christ, and that was Palm Sunday. But notice now, righteous and having salvation coming with gentleness, coming with gentleness. So the little babe that we adore at Christmas time, maybe even have in nativity plays at the church, prior to this corona nonsense that's going on, that little baby would grow up. That little child would be that of pure righteousness offering salvation. But notice when this was forecasted, Zechariah chapter 9. He's one of the minor prophets. So this is well before the heavens parted and the shepherds heard the angels say the message. 
Now in Micah 5.2, we know that he was born in Bethlehem of Judah. And I think this is important because it was also predicted and fulfilled. And the way this prophecy came into fulfillment was an edict that was mandated that all of the Jewish people had to go back to their hometowns to register for the taxation. That's how God got Mary and Joseph, who were from Bethlehem, down there to get registered. And the, uh, the Christ child was born. And this is in fulfillment of that. And of course, Isaiah 714, a major prophet predicted he would be born of a virgin. And we know that is totally impossible. Even artificial insemination requires the male seed in order for uh, an embryo to form and supposedly be born. This child will be born of a virgin. She knew no man. In fact, she said that to the angel. How can this be? I don't know any man. Now, she might have been engaged to Joseph at the time, but they, they had been morally pure with one another. And so... Why is this important? This is important because it goes all the way back to where we're going to wind up here in a few minutes, that the Christ child would be the sinless Savior of the world. He would be the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. In order to do that, he had to be born without the male seed, the Holy Spirit conceived Jesus in Mary's womb, sinless, perfect. And the reason this is so important is Romans chapter 5. By one man, sin came into the world, and by one man, death passed unto all men. And so because of Adam's willful sin and deliberate disobedience, sin passed unto the entire world. So every time a child is born, that sin nature from the male is resident in that child. And that child is a sinner. Now, there are special exceptions if the child dies early in life, and this is verified by David's response, King David's response, when that child uh, died. He said, I cannot bring the child back to me, but I can go to the child. So we would certainly believe that the child was in paradise, and that's where David went. This is important, Jesus being born of a virgin. Now notice in Isaiah 53 verse 5, he would be pierced for our transgression and crushed for our iniquities. Now, this is, this is Isaiah writing. He's a major prophet. And the Orthodox and traditional Jews, even in Jesus' day, thought that they were the ones being persecuted. They did not see the Messiah here. Their concept of the Messiah was one coming in on a white stallion and liberating the Jewish people from Roman bondage and putting Roman bondage and the Jews would reign over them. They had no conceivable idea that the Son of God, the Messiah, would be born as a little baby and grow up. And so this is important for us to understand what this is all about, that Jesus was going to, what is Christmas all about? This is what it's about. But we still have to go back a little bit further. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, he would be a prophet like Moses to whom God said, we must listen. So he's going to have a specific ministry and a specific message. And you see that throughout the gospel. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. And of course, again, the Jews, misinterpreting Isaiah, understood the kingdom of God as, oh good, we're going to get to reign and uh, give it back to those 
who have treated us poorly. And then in Genesis 3.15, this is known as the Proto-Evangelium. Proto meaning first, Evangelium meaning good news. This is the first time the good news of a Messiah coming was predicted. And where are we at? We're in the Garden of Eden. We're in the Garden of Eden. Adam and uh, Adam and uh, Eve have sinned. Satan or the serpent is there. And notice what they all hear. And I stressed that on Sunday, and it just came to me. Satan heard this. The Messiah would be the offspring of a woman and would crush the head of Satan. The serpent already knew the defeat was imminent. It was going to come, but he will try his best to derail God's program that he has put into place. And we will see that next week, how Satan tried to steal Christmas. You remember the story of the Grinch? In fact, I've never read that story. Or I've never seen it on TV. All I know is that, that green face there. Um, and how he tried to steal Christmas. But we're going to change it to how Satan tried to steal Christmas. And you can, if you look for it, you can see it all throughout Scripture. So where are we at here? Well, we come back to Galatians 4 now. And from Genesis, we can fast forward to Galatians 4, okay? Genesis says uh, he's going to come. Galatians says here's how he's going to come and what he's going to do. When the fullness of time came, in other words, at the right time, at the right time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, not mysteriously manifesting himself on a white steed, born of a woman, born under the law, so he might redeem those who are under the law. So Christmas is about redemption. It's not about the exchanging of gifts. It's not about the decorating of trees. It's not about school pageants and church plays. It's about redemption. It's about redemption. Now, Christmas is the foreknowledge of a sovereign God giving an indescribable priceless gift to his creation. Christmas began in eternity past. Before there was ever Genesis 1-1, in God's mind, there would be a Christmas because he knew in creation what would happen, that man would rebel and man would believe the lie of the serpent to try to be autonomous. And then from there, it just spiraled, spiraled downhill and almost out of control. But God knew that. God knew that, and he in eternity past had already decided he was going to give an indescribable, priceless gift to his rebellious, rebellious creation. That's us, and that gift was his son. They say that the American family here will spend about a little under $1,000 in gifts little under a thousand dollars in gifts this year it's um, uh, lower than it was in 2019 and here's a thought for us there is no gift that you can give to your spouse to your children to your boss whatever there is no gift that you can give that is more expensive than the good news of Jesus Christ because it cost God his son. That's what it, it cost God everything. It cost him his son. So if you celebrate Christmas that way, and I'm not, I'm not saying that you shouldn't, don't misunderstand me, but sometimes we get so wrapped up in the exchange of gifts, maybe the disappointment in getting a gift or hoping to get a gift that we didn't, uh, the meal, the preparation, the busyness of going to see the lights and the displays and all of the cantatas that we forget 
at the heart of Christmas is redemption. It is forgiveness. Understanding when Christmas actually began helps to strip away the commercialism which robs God of our adoration for his unspeakable grace gift of his son. You know, we give gifts to people and probably deep down inside, uh, they were on Santa's naughty list, but we give the gift anyways. The time of good cheer. It's a time of greeting people on the sidewalk. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. But you know what? God gave us this gift in that while we were yet sinners, Ephesians 2, he gave us his son. Now, the question is, will I accept this gift or will I reject the gift? And so next time we get together, we're going to talk about how Satan tried to steal Christmas. Um, I will try to re-record these and get them posted on the blog site. Um, if you know people who are unable to get to church because of the virus or other things, and they have a computer or a laptop, or I think even a tablet or a iPhone, give them the link that uh, they can tune in and, and uh, try to stay up with their church service. Thanks for so much for allowing me to take a few minutes and come into your world with God's word.